Yeah, 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 that'd be great. Yeah, I use a lot of opera. I was using opera steadily until two days ago when I had a problem with the opera interface actually. Some of the JavaScript was in the opera oh, interface yeah. to view uh, tabs for Windows quit working. And so the tabs would disappear and reappear. When you, ready? Okay. And so when you go, I have seven tabs open all the time. <laughs> Couldn't tell what was up and what was down. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, we're on. Okay. So ready? Okay. I can I can go ahead. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started today. And uh, I want to let you know as we start, we're going to do a very casual format. And I want you to, if you, if you have ideas about files, feel free to ask questions. Today we're going to be talking about accessibility and the quick tips for online course accessibility. These quick tips, were, we went over them in a, work, a workshop series earlier this semester. And this is kind of a wrap up to that, but we're going into a little bit more depth. We're not going to talk about why things need to be accessible. We're not going to talk about the law. We're just going to get to how you make it accessible. In the handout you have, uh, there are some quick tips that Sarah Silva, Silva did for us. Uh, she's over in the library, and I forget exactly which office she's in. Um, at iTech. Um, all, all the iTech folks over there. Uh, and Silva, Sarah helped us do these, and they've been really helpful. And I'm going to go over the website. They're actually available. We have more quick tips in this. However, since we're do, doing our workshops, we found that themes came up over and over again, PowerPoint, PDF, Word files. And we're taking this opportunity to go in a little bit more depth. And we're actually going to work with these files up on the screen. So feel free to have me go back and repeat another step. And we'll make this available on the website for IDT uh, later on. So th these steps are outlined in the, in the PowerPoint. But we're just going to take an in-depth look. I'm Jason Maceberg Tomlinson. I'm an adaptive technology specialist for the Disability Sports Services, which means I mess around with a lot of technology. I work with students with disabilities, and I do a lot of cool stuff and cool computer stuff. Um, and I'll introduce Phyllis Epps, who is the manager of the MDC over in the library, and she's helping out because there are some tools in the MDC that are very helpful for getting some of these things done. However, we are going to keep it pretty basic. and. We're going to talk about PDF, PowerPoint, and Word, which are tools most of us have in our offices. PDF, we're going to talk a little bit about Adobe Acrobat Professional, which is available in the MDC. Very helpful. It's a great program. Um, a lot of people have it, but a lot of people don't. We will get a little bit in depth on that. It's really the only tool we're going to talk about today that's not readily available. We're also going to talk a little bit about alternatives to PowerPoint and some resources available, again, with the MDC. The quick tips are actually located on a website at kstate.edu slash dss slash kaccess. Our kaccess site goes over the technology stuff, stuff for online learning. Uh, most of my job is in regards to distance students. I work with students who actually range from Alaska to Florida right now who have disabilities, who are taking online classes, and I work with getting their accommodation set up, which means I work a lot with the interface of K-State Online. And this website has been built in order to get information to faculty members on how to create accessible content. K-State Online itself is working really well. I'm happy to say that I haven't had any students have any issues with K-State Online. I have students who have a wide range of disabilities. So the interface is great. What comes up for us, though, are, are the files themselves. And especially with the transition through different Office products. We've begun to learn, learn to use different tools, uh, such as formatting, or a different way to go about that in the last two versions of Microsoft Office. And so it's about how you create those file formats. Um, and another kind of confusing thing has been, there are actually four Office products. And we have the 2003-2007 Office. Right now we're moving into 2007. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But then Mac actually has a version 2004 and 2008, kind of one year later off of each one. You would think they'd be very similar, but they're actually quite different. Today we're going to talk about the Windows, because that's what most of us use. Those of us who are Mac users quite a bit, though, will know that there are some differences within the Mac operating system and how it uses Microsoft Office. If you have any questions specific to that, feel free to let me know. I work quite a bit 
uh, with that format. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, some of the tools we're going to talk about today aren't available on Mac. Um, long story. <laughs> I wish I knew more answers to that. The uh, area we're going to start off is PDFs. How many people use PDFs quite a bit? A number of us. I think it's a file format that's really gone from kind of behind the scenes to really the forefront. And recent news, it's now a standard. Uh, PDF, the dot .pdf is now a standard just like txt and rtf. It's no longer just proprietary language. Uh, the one quick tip handout goes over PDFs and accessibility. And we're going to take a look at PDFs uh, directly. Let me. With PDF files, they're quite tricky, actually. Um, the, there we go. The PDF file format allows us to scan documents in from, a, from multiple resources. You can print to a PDF with Microsoft Word. You can scan it off of a, a scanner as you're doing an image. And from these two, you get two totally different documents. Here, for instance, we have a PDF document of two pages. And it's the same. Let me shrink this down a little bit. It's actually the same page, scanned in twice, in two different ways. And actually, these were both scanned with a document scanner. Uh, however, with this top document, you'll notice I can go through and select text, much like you can in Microsoft Word, whereas the bottom document, I can't. <laughs> I just get little blocks. Text is, is very important for people using adaptive technology. A lot of people with disabilities use adaptive technology such as screen readers and uh, well actually in, in text to speech programs that take the computer text, uh, real text as I call it, it's really uh, alphanumeric data that it can read back through an electronic voice. Um, I used to have a, a little snippet of War Games, a 1983 movie with Matthew Broderick where it's computers talking to them. It's that same technology. It's been updated. It's gotten a lot better. Uh, there are new softwares that actually it sounds like a real person. And uh, if you have a cell phone provider, a phone company, or you've called into a switchboard where you have to listen to a whole menu, it sounds like a real voice. But I can guarantee 60% of those are actually a uh, computer voice. So they sound very, very realistic. And our students use these programs in order to hear the document. A large population of our students with disabilities have learning disabilities. That's actually one of our largest groups on campus. And there are other types of disabilities uh, which a uh, text program is very useful, so hearing it versus seeing it. Uh, there are a lot of students who are auditory processing and visual, visual processing may be tougher for them. Reading a document, they may not be able to get much out of it. Hearing a document, they could probably recite the whole thing to you and know every little detail about that. We've got a lot of students in the hard sciences where Looking at it, it's tough, listening to it, and they've got it all. And it's stuff that if I read through it five times, I wouldn't understand. So what we run into with PDFs is that we have uh, documents that don't have text. And this often happens when we scan them in to a, just to be scanned in as a PDF. Now, when you go from like Microsoft Word, oftentimes text is there. There are tools, however, available in order to add text to the PDFs. And for instance, well, first of all, how do you know if there's text? As you can see, I can select it. And it looks like Microsoft Word. It's actually selecting the text. And actually, if I copy this, um, let's find a program. You can do a simple text of just copying and pasting. <clears throat> and there we go. We have all the text. If you can do that with your document, and you have a, sh uh, a, a fairly short document, uh, just take a little bit of text, look at it, look at how much of the document actually scan did well, then you have a pretty accessible PDF, and chances are it's going to work pretty well for a lot of students. Our prim primary concern is that students have access to this text. Um, and that goes for students with learning disabilities as well as students with visual impairments. Students who are blind will use a, a program such as uh, JAWS which is jo uh, job access with speech. And they'll actually control the whole computer with the keyboard, not even look at the screen, obviously, uh, and just listen to everything. 
and they'll do the same thing. If you have a document, though, <clears throat> that you cannot select text, there are a couple ways to go about checking the accessibility. Or if you try and select text and nothing seems to be working, Adobe Acrobat has actually added a couple tools in the last couple versions that do an accessibility check for you. And this is really helpful if you have a lot of images, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. You can actually go up to, oops, get this right here. There we are. Advanced, down to accessibility, and you have a quick check and a full check. I recommend just doing a quick check, and this will actually check the accessibility of the document, and the quick check will give you some basic language to see what the accessibility is. Now here we're going to run into something a little bit weird. It's going to say part of it's accessible, part of it's not, because we have two pages. One is accessible, one's not. But this quick check is a quick and easy way of having it tell you the situation with the document. Here it says accessibility quick check complete. This document has logical structure but is not tagged PDF. Some accessibility image information may be missing. Now the tagged PDF, we're not going to wor worry about that as much. Uh, tags are kind of like HTML tags. It's telling you what's a heading one, a heading two. And there are ways to go into doing that, but I'm not going to worry about that today. Because um, oftentimes it's not as necessary with PDFs. But here it says some accessibility information may be missing. That concerns me because, A, I know that one page is inaccessible, but two, we'll want to kind of look into that. Go ahead. Okay. It's up here. Actually, let me. <clears throat> it's under, if you click on advanced in the menu, and then accessibility, and then it's under quick check. You're welcome. I'll run the full check now. The full check is a little bit different. It'll actually give us quite a report on the entire document. Text is only part of the accessibility. If you have pictures and you have a student who is blind, that's going to become a problem. You need to get that information to the student. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, with Adobe, it's important as well. And here, <clears throat> I, I had to do a full check, and it gives us a little bit more information. It tells us that none of the images have alternative text, so we don't have any text description of what that image is. If a student who is blind reads over that, they're just going to skip over it, which is okay for this document because I know none of the pictures in here are important. The only pictures are actually my fingers uh, approaching on the this edge of the document. But if you had a picture of a wildcat and it was important to the document, it was in, in, important information, you need to have text that goes with it. I'll show you how to add that in a second. It also tells us that 30 text blocks with no language specified. <clears throat> if you're dealing with a Spanish course, this would be important. If it's just an English course, if the text is in English, it wouldn't be as important. I think that's more in an international setting. Uh, and none of the contents or annotations in this document are contained in the structure tree. Again, uh, how many people have worked with HTML before? A couple people. And as you know, um, when you write HTML for web pages, you have headings on a first level, headings on a second level, and so on. It's the same within PDF. And this is going to bring up that up a couple times. I don't worry too much about that if it's a short PDF, 10-page article, for instance, because most of it's going to be text. If you have a big handbook that you're going to be using for years to come, then we need to talk uh, about the accessibility of that. The reason that exists is that if a person's listening to a 10-page, or a, let's say a 30-page handbook, obviously they're not going to visually peruse the handbook to see which headings are where. They're going to listen for those headings. And their technology can tell them what all the level one headings are and what text is underneath. Issue is, when adding that, those tags to a PDF, it's a long, arduous journey. Uh, and uh, it's kind of confusing the way they have it right now. They've been working out the last couple of years. So first, before we talk about the images, let's talk about adding text. How many people have Adobe Acrobat Professional on their home computer or their work computer? Okay. This is something you'd be able to do either with that at work or, again, going to the Media Development Center and Hale Library 
We've got it on a number of computers there. And they have helpful staff to show you how, uh, where it's located. This is a tool, or this product, which we're looking at using right now, actually, has been enhanced in the last couple versions. Adobe actually now has the power to add real text to these images. So again, this page we're looking at here, this is just an image. There's no actual text there as the computer sees it. It just sees a picture of pixels. But I can tell Adobe that I want it to look at this image and tell me if it can extract any text from that. And if I go up to document, there's a button down here called OCR recognition. Uh, <clears throat> up until, I would say in the last four years, to get a, a software product that used OCR, which is called optical character recognition, to have a, a software product to do that would cost you a couple hundred dollars. To have a software product to do that reliably would cost you $600, $700. And in the last couple versions of, of Adobe, they've built this in, <clears throat> and I have to say it works pretty well. I'm not going to tell this to look at this document and add any text that is missing. And it's going to ask how many pages, and I'm just going to do everything, and click OK. And this computer is so, oh, no, it is still working. There we go. You're, on the newest uh, uh, product, you're going to actually see a, a bar tell you how far through the process it is. Now, to give you some background to this document, I actually scanned this document using one of the uh, scanning stations in the library, at Hale Library. I was researching online technology and online learning. Uh, my field is student affairs. and. I just went up to one of these stations and actually scanned a same article about six different ways to figure out which settings worked best. And we did that actually as a Tech by Tuesdays article over the summer. And I just scanned it in with one of those and I opened it up with Adobe Acrobat Professional and I told it to find the text and I kept one of the pages without any text and now we did that again and as you can see it selects all the text. There are sometimes, if you, I don't know, I have an example, but there are a couple times when you have a bad scan, when the contrast is just bad, you have a background color, unfortunate environment. It'll actually leave little white spaces over words that it did not recognize. It's a good way to tell kind of how much of it worked. And so oftentimes, if I have a three-page article I'm scanning for a student, I'll just select all of the text in that article and see how many of those white spaces I get. If I get 95% of it right, that's awesome. Um, then it's going to be a pretty good article. Um, and there are going to be a couple words that I can uh, talk with the student about, or I can save it as a, a text file and give it to the student that way and correct those myself. <clears throat> if you end up with about 50% of the text, you've got to figure a way to rescan it or work uh, to enhance it to increase the contrast, which is unfortunately a difficult process. But for the most part, if you scan into Adobe Acrobat, it's going to find the text really well. And I've had a really good luck with it, even using the scanning station, which you'd think it wouldn't have as much accuracy because the camera's way up here and the document's way down here. But they're surprisingly powerful. And so you can do a whole article. I've actually done a 100-page article and had it recognize all the text in the article, and it does pretty well. Um, I think I bet it was probably 90% accurate which I was just testing it, and I was pretty happy with that. So, um, <clears throat> now, graphics are a little bit different. So let's go. <clears throat> so we just added text. Graphics are a little bit different. How, um, in working with web, the, the web, HTML, there's a tag, it's called an alt tag, A-L-T tag. It's an alternative tag, and it's a way that we give information, information to a person who is blind about that image and the importance of the image, the relevancy of the image. And I think that's where it became most popular. And we, we now call them alt tags on it, a couple other documents, Word documents, PowerPoint, and PDF. And with PDF, and again, this is kind of in the recent development, development of PDF, we can actually touch up the uh, the tags and the add alt tags to a graphic in a PDF file. So here, I do know I've got a couple images because my finger is stuck in the way. Um, 
if I go back up to advanced, and again down to accessibility, there's a touch up reading order uh, button. And it's kind of deceiving. The actual tool within Adobe is to, to change the reading order of a document and to work with the different objects within that document. Uh, believe it or not, when you scan something in, it'll usually get the reading order correct. But there are a couple, docu uh, a couple programs that you can create Adobe files out of, such as OpenOffice or Mac Word 2004. I haven't tried it on 2008 yet, where it'll get the reading order wrong, which it looks a very linear structure. But for some reason, it'll move things around. And this is a tool you can actually go in and move those things around. I find it helpful, though, because it'll actually help me look at images and give them alternative text. I just click on the tool and then double click on an image. And you'll notice there's a faint blue line around it. And then it asks me what I want to call that. I'm going to call that a figure. So I click on that and it already tells me, okay, I've labeled this a figure, but you have no alternative text for this figure. And if you're creating an, actually a PDF, you can do this as well. I'm actually going to go ahead and close this. Now I'll right click on, on that picture. And if you put pictures into a PDF, you also have this tool. It'll actually ask me if I want to edit the alternative text. And I can click on there and type in the alternative text. Here, I want to type in a graphic of my finger. Click OK. And now, when I, if I pulled up that same tool I did a little bit ago, it'll actually tell me the alternative text for that graphic is graphic of my finger. And so it's a very helpful tool if you work with PDFs quite a bit to go through. You can add text to your document and you can add alternative text to your graphics. And I mentioned this for a couple of reasons. Obviously, if you have a student with a disability in your class, with a learning disability or some sort of disability with text in regards to reading, this is uh, imperative to have all of this information in your PDF. Also, I find that most people who use PDFs are going to use them for years to come. It's not just something you create to use one semester. You're going to have them around for quite a while. And it's nice to have them all set up because you never know um, when you have a colleague in the field you want to send something to who's got a disability. You have students who are going to come to your class and you want to pull out this as a reference during the class period. And there you have it already and accessible. So that's kind of a quick overview of PDF. Does anybody have any questions about PDFs? That's it. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. I would recommend doing an HTML, and <clears throat> that's for a couple different reasons. Uh, PDF has is, is become a lot more common. However, HTML is a little bit more common. Most people have, obviously, a web browser on their computer. And web browsers tend to be set up uh, with a lot of accessibility to them. And a lot of people, especially, let's say you had a person who was blind, that's going to be very common to them because they're, they're going to browse the internet. They're going to chat with their friends online. They're going to do all those, use all those tools. If they haven't used PDFs too often, they may not be aware of some of the accessibility features within the PDF. Only recently have the adaptive technologies been uh, adapted or changed to be usable with PDF files and run into a couple different things. One, as these programs have improved, there are new key commands to use with, let's say, PDF files. And students may not know those uh, key commands. And also, the programs that a person who is blind especially is going to use, uh, JAWS, it's a very expensive program. It's $1,300 for uh, basic. I think that's what the base is now. And so their version might be three years old. And if it's three years old, it may not have the power to look at the, this document in an accessible way or to navigate the document. Whereas in HTML, it's been used for many years, and it's quite usable. Uh, so if you have the time and, does, and ability to turn, turn it into an HTML, that's something you may want to think about. The other question that often comes up with that, however, is security. And 
PDF, obviously, one of the reasons it came about was for security reasons. <clears throat> and its relationship with security is kind of tricky. Um, and obviously online, it's going to be more secure than an HTML file. HTML, you don't have any security measures there. With PDF, you have two levels of security. You have a, I can't remember what the levels of encryption are. You have like a 40-bit encryption and a 100-bit encryption. So I don't know what those exact numbers are. The first level of encryption, if you add security to an accessible document, the text will be there. And it'll be accessible on if the student is using a PDF Acrobat viewer. It'll only be accessible through that product. They'll have to actually use, there's a reader built into the viewer now. They'll have to use that reader to read the document. And then there's another level of security, which it actually takes all accessibility and wipes it out. So you can't select text. You can't do anything with that document. You can only read it visually. Now, while there is accessibility with that first tier, um, it's not one that I'm really comfortable with because you can't use other adaptive technology with it. You have to use the reader within Adobe Reader. And the Adobe Reader isn't the fastest thing in the world. It uses a lot of RAM. It reads the whole page or nothing at all. Or it actually reads the entire document, the whole page, or nothing at all. Which if you think about a student who's studying, you want the student to be able to skim. And it takes out those features. So I really kind of have you think about how secure do you really need it. If you're really worried about security, can you just send it to that student only? Um, think about measures like that. Uh, but it is possible to do both online, HTML and Adobe. HTML is a little bit more uh, accessible. Adobe is a little bit more secure. That's a great question. Yeah. Yes. Oh, really? <clears throat> yeah. And tell us what. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's a very good point. Different browsers look at text differently, different um, fonts. I guess. Yeah. And now there, there's a Google Chrome, there's Firefox, there's Opera, there's Internet Explorer, and then there are about 15 others uh, variations of those. Um, Standards, that's a good question. Unfortunately, I think we're going to run into standards issues periodically. I run in, uh, there's a browser called Opera, which is supposed to be very standard specific. I run into problems all the time where it's not able to, I've had a problem lately with Flash, where it's not able to interpret some of those standards. They change quite frequently and they have to get updated. But then also, each browser, um, they, they, they don't interpret the standards in the same way, I think is the best way to put it. Uh, Internet Explorer, for instance, you can, you can write your code in a very inaccessible, non-standard way, and it'll still interpret it the way you want it to. Um, we do run into issues periodically where something is put online and it's not displaying the way we want it to. And that's unfortunately something that we, just, uh, that we have to look at that problem then in there. Uh, with accessibility and with creating documents, I've definitely run into situations where I've thought something was going to be very accessible, and it turns out the student has a browser that's four years old or older technology, and we just have to adapt. And when that comes up, we're here to help out. Just contact our office, DSS office, and we'll see what we can do to set up an example. Um, but that's a good question. And with, in fact, with um, fonts, uh, different computers don't have the same font set. I've, I've worked with a lot of math professors who want to use a certain font to display math equations. And those are missing from some computers. And so that's a, always a struggle. And overall, just I think with web standards as a whole, uh, not just accessibility. But, yeah. Any other questions about PDF? Um, related to the, the web standards, um, I, I still use M dash on my web pages. Do you? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that's. And I think you're also seeing a gravitation towards use of CSS too, to use some of those older or older HTML codes less. Um, emphasis, uh, bold, a lot of those. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. The W3C uh, has been considered kind of the standard for a lot of things, and they've especially looked at accessibility. And a lot of adaptive technology looks to that to be the, the standards basis uh, for that. Yeah. There are always new technologies coming up, and they may start out inaccessible, and there's just no way to access them, and then they do adapt. Um, I think Flash is a good example of that. Flash was used in different ways for a while. And over time, we were able to use that interface a little bit more in an accessible nature. Yeah. We'll move on to PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint is, uh, we're just going to kind of run through a couple interesting pieces that come up with PowerPoint. I've actually been talking about PowerPoint for, I've spent like six years talking about PowerPoint and given a presentation specific to this. So this is my general fast forward through. But there's some interesting parts to PowerPoint that I think are important to go over. And believe it or not, we're actually not going to get too technical here. Because using PowerPoint in an accessible manner is the easiest way to use PowerPoint. Uh, so if you try to add a lot to PowerPoint, that's when it gets inaccessible. And we're going to actually switch views here. And we're going to go to the template, or the, I guess, not template, but the kind of the user interface here. First, I want you to become familiar with the user interface of PowerPoint. I think knowing this, the, the tools involved are important. On the side, you have your slides, but you also, something that people don't use often, you have an outline view. This is very important, and we're going to see that how, why it's important in a second here. You also have an area down here for notes, another overlooked area that is a, is a great tool. And we're going to go up here, if I remember format, there we go. If you go under Format, you can click on an area that says Slide Layout. Or if you open up PowerPoint, this is oftentimes already on there. And these are the templates that slides can be set up in. And I've also moved along here. The templates are very important, and I'm going to talk a lot about them today, because they're set up in an accessible format. These templates are kind of power, part of PowerPoint. It knows what to expect out of these templates. And adaptive technology knows what to look for in use of these templates. Do we have anybody use Office, who uses Office 2007? We do. Number of people. OK. This is going to look a little bit different on Office 2007. Thanks to Shashti over here. We've got a video to go along with it. A second here. Ow. Let's do this. Okay. <clears throat> so here, this is Office 2007 with PowerPoint. 
and we've created some Quick Tips videos to go along with our Quick Tips sheets in order to update things for our Office 2007. We've done a lot of things with Office 2003. And with Office 2007, to get these templates, you just click on Layout, and then you can select the templates from there. It's the same way as if you create a new slide and you, collect, you select a template on this side of Office 2003. And you have a, a new slide button as well for if you're creating a new slide, what template you want to use for that. And you'll, you've probably noticed if you've used PowerPoint on Office 2007, the templates are a little bit different. Uh, they look a little bit different. They have some new styles. They have some interesting new styles, actually. I think they're quite cool. Um, the important thing is that you use these templates. And the main reason for that is uh, we have found that adaptive technology, as well as PowerPoint, doesn't like it when you go outside of the templates, especially adaptive technology. But I'm going to show you here. So here we have an example of a slide. And we're using the template. We're using this one right over here with the bullet points underneath. And we have the text showing up here. And you look over here. This is the slide we're currently on. And it says this uses a template. And it's got a bullet here. The text shows up on the outline. Notice how that relates to the outline to our slide. Now I'm going to go to the next slide. And what you're going to notice over here is that the text is the exact same. But when I click on that slide, I've got a whole different text box. Here, we've got a text box that I added. I clicked on the template, created a, uh, I used a template, and then I went up to insert text box and typed my own text box in there as a text object. This text doesn't show up on the outline. And if it's not showing up on the outline, it's not going to show up on a lot of tools for PowerPoint. And it's definitely not going to show up for adaptive technology. Um, some software adaptive technology has changed to find these objects, but creating these rogue objects, uh, it can be confusing to users, especially if you have important information there relative to the next bullet, and they hear the second bullet without that information, and you've lost them. And believe it or not, I actually had a whole presentation that was shown at an accessibility conference, and we got it to put it up on a web page. I went to put it on the web page, and no screen reader would read any text off of it. And that was by the National Blind Federation. <laughs> it's some examples. So I, they're just, and, and I mentioned that because I think what was thought was we had a present, it was a presentation we attended, and it was just meant for the audience. And they didn't realize how people would gravitate towards that presentation and want more out of it. And so they put it online. PowerPoint's mostly a presentation tool. And now we're using it in more ways. We're using it to really uh, get information to our students. And it's different from the original intention of PowerPoint. And it's changing a little bit for the positive, for the negative, not to say. But nonetheless, we have to think about that. And so when creating uh, slides on a PowerPoint, you always want to think about your objects over on the right side, your templates. It's also a matter of the order. <clears throat> Here we have two lists using the side-by-side -side template. We've got list one and list two. I'm from a farm area in Iowa, so I automatically think about cars and tractors. And so we've got cars on one side, tractors on the other side. What I want to point out here, on this side, PowerPoint automatically uh, thinks the order should read from left to right. Uh, the English language reads from left to right, so we're obviously going to often think about that. And so it puts this list first, this list second, as you'll see over here. However, You'll notice down here, I've got a uh, same slide, same order, but I've moved those two lists. I actually see this happen quite a bit in that professors or faculty members, staff will create a PowerPoint and decide that they want to switch those two around. There's some relevancy to having it the opposite way around. PowerPoint doesn't know that, however. When you click and drag these boxes, it's going to keep them in the order you type them in. Um, I've also seen this happen when you have a text box such as, well, that's not going to show up too well. If you had, let's say, four boxes and you move those around, the same thing's going to happen. So when you go to create a PowerPoint, have the image of what you want it to look like in your mind as you type it up and make sure that everything's the same. If you want to move things around, create a whole new slide and retype your information. 
weird enough, this also goes for how you enter your information in regards to the text on the bottom and the text on the top. You would think it always think of headings first, but for some reason, PowerPoint puts an order structure to how you type in your information. So if you type this information first and the heading second, it creates a reading order, and it's going to read this first to adaptive technology and this second. Uh, so a student who is blind is going to hear these in reverse. And it took us a couple of months. We actually, uh, a group of us at the University of Akron looked at PowerPoint for a couple of months, trying to run it through a whole bunch of tests. And this came up quite often with a number of presentations we were working with faculty on. And so something simple, but good to keep in mind, it, you'd be surprised at how important that is to a PowerPoint and accessibility. <clears throat> Graphics are also uh, important to PowerPoint. Obviously, we use it quite a bit. <clears throat> and I talked earlier about alternative text. And alternative text is important for PowerPoint as well. Here, I'm going to add a graphic. I'm going to insert. I've got a graphic. And again, I use a template on their basic graphics. And now I want to add alternative text. If you have Office 2003, you insert alternative text by clicking Format Picture, Web, and you type in your text. You type in the title. Well, first you start off with, is it a graphic? Is it a photograph? Here we have a graphic. What is it of? It's a K-State wallpaper. And then you add any relevant information, why it pertains to the PowerPoint, why it pertains to your course, anything that's relevant that you expect the student to know. If you're going to test the student over the information, make sure you're giving them that information through your alternative text. And click OK. You're not going to see any changes. But when adaptive technology reads over this, it's going to read back to them. With 2007, again, it's a little bit different. And this goes for. PowerPoint and for Word, Microsoft moved this around a little bit. And when you right click on an object, rather than click on format picture or anything that would sound like you're going to change the alternative text, you actually click on size and position. And then you type in here for alt text. <clears throat> It took us a while to figure this out, and thanks to Ben for bringing this up when we were working on it uh, in the MDC. And you can type in your, your text there. It's The other way was confusing to a lot of people as it was, and this kind of took it one step further and made it a little bit more confusing. So think about size when you think about alternative text. <clears throat> and that goes for Microsoft Word as well. There's another funky way of adding graphics to a, a PowerPoint presentation. And I, I suggest this if you're working, if let's say you're having somebody put together a PowerPoint and unable to find the add alternative text and you're in a hurry, you want to create alternative text at the same time you want to get your picture in there, but you're not sure how to get it done quickly. I'm going to add that same graphic. And you'll notice here I have graphic of K-State desktop. Visually, whoops, I can actually move this across. and size it up. So when I give my presentation, it looks like I have a graphic on the screen, and nobody sees the text under it. But when a screen reader reads across it, it actually hears that text I have hidden in the background. It's a nice, sneaky way um, that I picked up a, about a month or so ago. And it can be kind of a kind of fun tip. And also, it's a way to ensure that that text is going to be there. And we're going to look at it a little bit later on, on how that can be important for uh, when you want to print up an outline, even. As I said earlier, this bottom area is quite important, although we don't use it that much. This is where I, in a lot of my presentations, I'll actually type my transcript down here and read from there. Um, <clears throat> or type an outline down here and read from there off the computer. If you're doing a presentation for a class, it's a great way to get more information to a student. If you're going to publish your PowerPoints up to K-State Online after you give a lecture, you want to think about how did you enhance that PowerPoint when you're in class. And do you think that would be helpful for your students? You can type that information up here, and students will see that when they look at the PowerPoint. They can go to this view and see that information down there. A student with a screen reader, they can hear this information too. 
and they can select that information. So you have a student who's doing, let's say, a distance education class and used a lot of PowerPoints and they learned from those PowerPoints, but you had some information in those slides that you wanted to go into a lot of detail on, but you couldn't add just alternative text. It's a nice way to add more text than is appropriate for an alternative text tag. Those who work with HTML know that alternative text is supposed to be the short description. Here, this is kind of a long description of that text object. I really like it, though, for enhancing a PowerPoint. And whenever I put a PowerPoint on the web, I'll actually add to down here what I went over in the lecture so that it's a little bit more enhanced. Students are getting a little bit more out of it. Because again, it's meant for a presentation medium, not necessarily a information medium online. <coughs> and I like to go over video just to um, make sure people remember that if you have video built into a PowerPoint, you want to work with your instructional designers and your resources at K-State to see if you can get that captioned or if you can put a transcript up in either the notes area again or some other part of the PowerPoint presentation. And because you need to make sure that it's all areas of accessibility, especially if you have audio and video. And I'm also often asked, how, what about, you know, what if I've got the meaning in other areas? I'm asked this actually if I have a graphic on one side and I have text on the other side. If that text covers pretty much what the graphic is, do I have to add alternative text? It's not necessarily about having that, all that represented. It's having that meaning represented. If you have the meaning of the picture represented in your Word document and your PowerPoint, you don't necessarily have to go into detail then for alternative text. Video is pretty similar, and you're trying to get that same point across, all the information across. It's that, is that student a having access to all the information that audio users are? And it's just, it goes the same for captions, not necessarily word for word, but you want to get those ideas down. Um, although there are some services out there available to help give a transcript for information that will be word for word and work really well. Now, real quickly, I'm going to go cover a couple other pieces. Um, I don't know if people realize, but you can actually export a PowerPoint into an outline view. It's one of the reasons this side is so important is that I've worked with students who have a 56K dial-up, very slow internet connection, downloading a PowerPoint takes a long time. Well, you can actually save this information into a quick outline by going to File, Save As, Outline RTF. Okay, and usually it opens up right away. Oops. And you'll get something like this. Because PowerPoint uses the same heading format as HTML, as Word documents, it'll actually create your headings and all of your slides will make logical sense, but in an RTF format. This is all fine and dandy, except it doesn't print out the notes we typed in under our slides. Uh, it's something that's missing from this export. Um, and you can actually do that then through another method. And you can go, so you get your text, and I find that helpful to send to students if downloading is a trouble, or if the format's not working for some reason, like I said, Sometimes there are issues with adaptive technology, and if it's not able to open up that PowerPoint, this is another way we can get it to them in a quick and accessible way. You can also send it to a Word document. And when you click on Send To, down here under the File menu, this is kind of hidden on most uh, laptops. You actually get this Microsoft Word down here. And a lot of people are under, well, why would I want to send it to Microsoft Word? This will actually ask you if you want to Send it to Microsoft Word and have your notes below the slides. This is a nice feature because what happens <clears throat> Oh, I clicked on the wrong one, didn't I? Try that again. I'm not getting my file menu. Well, sure. But what happens is actually it'll print up your PowerPoint onto a Microsoft Word document with a picture of each slide, and then any notes you've typed typed on it below those slides. 
And I actually use it for probably 70% of my presentations. I'll use that as my notes that I'm going over in front of a class or in front of an audience. And that way you get the notes. Um, now let's say you had used a lot of notes and you wanted to get to, to a student in a word format, the outline and the notes. At this point, you have to kind of copy and paste from both to get the notes that were below to the outline in a Microsoft Word document to send to the student. For some reason, PowerPoint doesn't want to export all of the text into the same document. But I do that, find that a very helpful uh, resource for myself when giving a presentation, but also for students if they want study notes. Okay. Now, a lot of these same things go for um, Microsoft Word uh, in regards to the graphics. We've already gone over the alternative text. But you can also add styles to Microsoft Word. And this is one of the handouts we had available for you, was to go over Microsoft Word now to add styles instead of formatting. Um, how many people use styles in their Microsoft Word documents? I have a couple people. It's actually, it's a lot like HTML. And a lot of people ask, well, it looks the same. Why would it be that important? Styles actually are, um, are quite important on a couple different levels. Here, I'll just go ahead and open up. Here we have a document that was put together, and all of the bold areas, these headings, were put together using bold and some constraints up at the top on this formatting bar. A lot of people don't realize, and, and what this means is every time you want to create a bold heading, you have to click here, click there. It's quite a few steps. And if you have a 10-page document and you want to change the formatting, that's a half an hour long process. If you use styles, I'm going to go up here to view. And, oops. Oh, I'm thinking the wrong thing. Format. We go uh, format, styles, and formatting. And you notice all of a sudden I get these styles over here for headings, normal text. And if I go back up here to view, I click on normal. We go. I actually I went to options and down here under outline and normal options there's a style area width and at zero inches. It's kind of a funky tool again that's hidden. I'm going to change this to about one and a half inches and click on OK. All of a sudden this document is telling me what styles have been given to the text and right now it says normal for everything. Because as a document was typed, it was typed just using text and then formatted using formats up here. Unfortunately, when you have a student, when you have a student in class who reads over a document, they're going to highlight and then they're going to come back to that and skim later on. When you have a student who's using a, uh, alternative or adaptive technology, however, they're not going to know which headings are there, what normal text is there, which lists are there in the document. If they're going to skim, they're going to read the entire document again. Not exactly efficient. And so it's helpful to give this more markup and some better formatting. So actually, I'm going to select everything. And I can click on Clear Formatting. Now everything looks the same. However, I'm not going to use the styles. I'm going to click on the heading on the side and a style. And I can go through my entire document giving these various levels of importance throughout my Microsoft Word document. It's kind of a simple step, but it helps out quite a bit in regards to alternative te or adaptive technology. And in that now this, a reader or a student using this document is going to hear, okay, my first heading is the title. Okay, Course Accessible Standards Policy. My second headings, okay, it was approved on these dates. My third headings are these headings throughout the document. And then I can say, oh, well, I want to hear about the scope, so I can tell my software to tell me the, the text under the heading scope. Very helpful for skimming a document, especially if you have like a 10-page Word document. As the creator of these documents, you can also make some very quick changes to the formatting of your document with a click of a button. Here, 
I'm going to tell it to modify all of my normal text. Let's say I want this to be online. I don't expect students to print it out. So I want to use a sans serif font. I like to use a font called Verdana. So I want all of my normal text to be Verdana. I want it to be, I want it to look cool, so I'm going to make it 10 point font. And I click on OK. Notice how all the text then changed to meet these needs. And I changed actually the Verdana, so I actually changed some of the headings too. But all of my normal check text throughout the entire document that was labeled normal under the style sheet now switched to that font. I'll do the same for heading three. I'm going to modify this, and I want it to be Verdana as well. It's going to change those. This is very helpful as you go through. If you use styles to create a document, if you need to change it, you can easily make those changes. I find it very helpful for publications to magazines and journals. They often have strict guidelines on how they want things submitted. You can make those changes very quickly in the click of a button. On the user side of things, not only is it helpful for adaptive technology to know where those headings are, but if I'm at home and I have a visual impairment and I can't read the text under, let's say, the normal text, I too can go through there and tell it I want all my normal text to be a size 16, make it easier to read. Or as a study aid for all of your students in class, if they have a Word document, they can go through and change all the headings to be a certain color, all the normal text to be a certain color, and they can go through their document and say, okay, my level three headings to be another color to give it structure, a visual structure to the document. And it really helps in study strategies and skimming. Any questions about that? Again, it's a lot like HTML. And finding it as uh, time goes by, actually, a lot of different technologies, a lot of different file formats become very similar. And uh, HTML is being used in a lot of these. Some irrelevancy. And not only, it's kind of an international change, too. And there's actually a standard being used internationally called DAISY that uses this type of code to structure all of the documents so it can be opened by any word processing program in any adaptive technology. It is. Yep. Yes, and with if we were just to bold words, a screen reader would say maybe bold, which a lot of users will turn that off, that function off, because if you want it here, you know, if you have things just bolded or you've changed the font, your screen reader is going to go through and it's going to read that change every time, which gets quite annoying if it's every paragraph. Or it's going to skip over it. You just know you have a bold word. Well, what is that bold word? Is, it, is that bold word a vocabulary word or is it a heading? And the formatting, it's just there for a visual use. When you add a style, it's going to say, OK, we have a heading one, this is heading one, heading two, this is heading two. Or when you get to the vocabulary word, uh, in like, let's say it was like a textbook, you would actually say vocabulary word. You can actually create a style called vocabulary word and get that information. You can create and adapt these styles however you wish. Um, and you can actually you can save these styles as a .dot uh, file and apply them to any document you want. All of my documents usually have the same style, and I can export that that style to any other document I wish. Yeah. So that kind of covers it. With um, I'm running out of time pretty quickly here. That um, on a, uh, a file note. So I've kind of gone through those three areas really quickly. I want to touch upon then. I've, I've, there's a couple other formats I've used in regards to alternatives for PowerPoint. PowerPoint, as I said, is typically a presentation file format, not necessarily an information file format. And a couple projects have taken a look at this and how we use PowerPoints on the web. And two in particular, there's one called S5, developed uh, with the help of Eric Meyer out of Cleveland, and then Opera Slideshow, which was actually uh, created as part of the Opera browser, which is a web browser created in uh, northern Europe. And these file formats, I haven't used Opera too much, so I can't really speak on that. But S5 is a file format that a lot of users have gone to, especially accessibility-wise.
because it gets at a lot of these issues that we talked about with PowerPoint. Remember the notes wouldn't show up on the note when you printed it out and the outline is kind of funky. Well, this is actually a way of presenting using the web. And you can do it as a web page. This is an old presentation I did at another university. But I was talking with the class. It was actually education, instructional, it was instructional technology in a, a secondary education course. And we were just kind of briefly going over a lot of web stuff. And you can actually take off the bars and make this full screen so it looks exactly like a PowerPoint. You click on it, it advances just like a PowerPoint. But when I upload this file to the web, not only can students use this in the same way I did in class, they can click on a button and automatically have an outline up here. And you get a really good sense of how adaptive technology reads over your slides. And again, visually, but I have these added tools to it. There are a couple of these tools coming out as people gravitate away from PowerPoint and want something more universal. Again, you could actually you know, have an Apple user who doesn't use PowerPoint that much, use this as a web page instead. Um, a lot of browsers support this technology because it's only using CSS, which is pretty universal. And the kind of buttons that you added, you can get a quick outline and actually has down here for basic checklist two, text that I didn't write in the PowerPoint, it doesn't show up on the slides, but it shows up here, just like the notes field. And you can do the, all those tools we've been talking about with PowerPoint in another manner. So there are a couple tools out there to use other than PowerPoint that are quite helpful. This does take some HTML knowledge, actually quite a bit. It doesn't have an interface to create files. However, I have recommended to a couple of people use uh, the HTML format quite a bit, and they've actually been able to take it much further than they can take PowerPoint because you can add all this new cool technology that the web standards have developed over the last couple of years, including CSS, AJAX, Web 2.0 technologies and all. So I just wanted to point that out, because uh, I'm often, after going over PowerPoint, I'm asked, well, why use PowerPoint at all? And so I just, I just like to give other options. Although PowerPoint, I think, can be a very useful file format in just using it in the most basic way, um, as well as the others. There are actually very few tools needed for the other file formats to make them accessible. And so now that we've talked about all of this, I'll have Phil's talk a little bit about the uh, resources available. Okay, resources at K-State. So what can, where can you go to get help uh, with uh, your, your class or whatever that you're working on? Um, see, Jason, did you bring the, um, you did bring these, okay. So if, as you walked in, I hope you picked up one of the uh, bookmarks because the bookmarks have some wonderful resources for you. Um, I'd like to really draw your attention to the instructional designers and they're listed here. Um, ben Ward is here and uh, Shasti is here. Shasti McCurgy, their telephone numbers are on here, and there's also Shalin Heju, and so um, I encourage you to really call one of these people if you'd like help um, as you design your class or if you want to find out whether or not your present class is accessible. Um, thank you. I think You're you switched welcome. it. That was good. <laughs> that was interpretive there. Um, the Media Development Center that um, I'm the manager of is located in... Two All right. I know. Wait, maybe... No, all right. I know. Wait, maybe. 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 
No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. 
No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. Wait, maybe. No, all right. I have. 